Boys, this is probably one of the tankiest builds I've ever played. No, you know what? It is actually the tankiest build I've ever played. I think I can say that pretty safely. All the new things that GG has added to raise the bar, raise the ceiling on what's possible for tankiness in this game, this is probably the tankiest build I've ever played. This build is capable of face tanking Wave 30 simulacrums with little to no issues. I ran it up against some bosses, I've ran it up against pretty juiced maps, and it just seems like it doesn't really ever want to die. Between like 60,000 armor, 89 to 90 all resistance, immune to chaos damage through chaos inoculation, a ton of recovery thanks to our Aegis Aurora shield, as well as anything else that we've got going, regeneration, recovery, all that kind of good stuff. Our molten shells are like 10k every single time we use them because we've got like 65,000 armor or something like that. Like 65, 65 block and so, so many defensive layers, it's actually just kind of disgusting. Now you might be wondering, if we are so insanely tanky, it sounds like we've invested pretty much all in defenses, right? And there's no damage to speak of? Well, thanks to a pretty broken mechanic and a pretty broken interaction, uh, there's still damage. It's not the most damage in the world. You'd have to spend a lot of money to get a lot of damage, but it's capable of clearing Wave 30 Simulacrums and most of the in-game bosses with little to no problems. It's not gonna be racing. It's not gonna be the fastest kill that you've ever seen, but it's pretty adequate for how little damage that we take. So remember that this is Griffin Prey's build. Um, I have kind of just messed around with it. I wanted to see how powerful it was, wanted to give my take on it. I haven't really changed very much, because honestly it all was just really good. But I know a lot of people enjoy the way that I explain builds and I set up things for people, so I figured that I'd try to do that justice. Now remember, Griff has a guide already written for this, so if you prefer a written guide, make sure to go check down in the description that is linked there. Make sure to go support Griff and Prey. He's a cool guy. Now remember, boys, if you're enjoying this content or this video helps you out, make sure to give it a like. Also, only a small percentage of you are subscribed to this YouTube channel. Make sure to do that, and if you want to stay up to date with all the latest content, hit that little notification bell as well. Now without further ado, let's get into the video. All right, boys, so this is the simulacrum that I just showed off, the wave 30. Um, we didn't die once, as you could see. I had all my portals still up. Here's all the same items that were on the ground. It's pretty much completed. Everything is good. So, um, yeah, I mean, easily one of the tankiest builds that i probably ever played. It probably is the tankiest build that I've ever played. However, I do want to go over quite a bit when it comes to this build. There's a lot of little things to talk about, so remember there's going to be chapters and timestamps down below. You can jump to whichever section that you like. Now, as always, there is going to be a path of building, but it is going to be rather basic. I'm not going to go super in-depth because this is more just a review and kind of my own thoughts on what I think about this build. It is mainly Griff's build. I do want to reiterate that. This isn't my own creation or anything like that. I'm just kind of giving my review of it, see how I like it, see what it's good for, see what it's bad for, and kind of give my opinion. And I will explain to you how all the mechanics of the build work as well. So first, we're going to start off with the very basics of how this build works. The very basics of how this build works is that you throw money at it and it does really well. And that's honestly not even really joking very much. The two Two gems that we are going to be looking at are Phantasmal Cremation as well as Phantasmal Unearth. Now, unfortunately, due to these gems being ridiculously rare, and that is a like 10 weighting, I think, on both of these versus the rest of the weightings being like 50 or 100 or something like that. These gems are ridiculously rare. Um, I made the Phantasmal Cremation. I got uh, horribly unlucky and you can see all of the cremations that I made with uh, lenses right there if you're curious about how long that took. This gem, because it is so rare, it is very expensive. Um, if a lot of people are doing heist, this probably isn't that bad, but if no one's doing heist, it's like 12 to 13 exalt because it is so powerful just by itself. That is unfortunately the problem with playing this build is that my first criticism of it isn't really a criticism of the build at all. It's a criticism of how rare this alt quality is. The same exact thing goes for Phantasmal and Earth. This is eight to nine exalt right now, as far as I know. These two gems make up most of the damage of the build when combined with these gloves. Interestingly enough, I know these gloves look insane. This is cheaper than either of these. This costs on average half as much as Phantasmal and Earth does. I know that sounds crazy, but this are, these are plus one, plus one, plus two, plus one gloves. The plus one to, sh I think, intelligence gems doesn't do anything there. But the main way that this build works is that with Phantasmal Cremation and Phantasmal Unearth, these are being Omega buffed by Ashes of the Stars. Once again, one of the most powerful elements in the game right now. It is up there with, you know, Omniscience and all the other cool, you know, amulets that basically are all going to get nerfed next patch because, you know, GG doesn't like strong things. 
But the idea here is that because this alt quality on Phantasmal Cremation gives a chance to explode a nearby corpse when you're firing a projectile, because we have Ashes of the Stars, now if this was 30%, it would be, you know, a little bit closer to 100 here, but we have a 98% chance to explode a nearby corpse when firing projectiles. Now, if I pop up a cremation here, you will see that it is firing a ton of projectiles, right? Right now, our cremation, I think, is firing eight projectiles per second. So it's firing three additional projectiles based, and then we are using greater multiple projectiles, which is four additional. So that is seven additional projectiles, which means eight. Now, initially, when I first looked at this ability and I first looked at Phantasmal Cremation, because very early on in the league, when Ashes of the Stars started to get popular, I went through all of the alt quality gems and saw which ones looked interesting. Phantasmal Cremation did look interesting, but I was not aware of how busted this interaction actually is. When it says 98% chance to explode a nearby corpse when firing projectiles, I read Cremation, because I hadn't played it in a very long time, as it fires eight projectiles every one second. But I thought it did like one wave of projectiles, and I thought that this was a 98% chance to explode a corpse every second. And I was like, wow, if you got three of those up, that's three additional corpses that are popping every second, that's pretty strong. It turns out I was wrong. It is a corpse for every projectile that is shot. That means eight projectiles per second, three cremations, that's a lot. And on top of that, whenever we're clearing like a simulacrum or something like that, we have two additional projectiles from Dying Sun, which means that we're getting 30 projectiles popping a second, 30 corpses popping a second. It's a little bit insane to be honest with you. Now, the idea here is that due to that, as well as Phantasmal Unearth, which is spawning like level 89 corpses, plus um, we have the Unearth spawns corpses with plus five level helmet enchant. It's spawning like super high tier corpses. Our Unearth is level 29 right now. It, um, it can go to 30 if we decided to get either like like a plus one to all spells uh, weapon or something like that. But the idea here is that it's got 146% increased maximum life. It's like 94 level corpses or something like that. So we're spawning some pretty high level corpses. Now you can see we spawn five of these little skeletons every single time that we cast on earth. Now you would think, well, big ducks, why don't you just use like, you know, a desecrate or something like that and get some high, super high level, uh, you know, specters or something. Well, they nerf specter life. And if you scale on earth to the moon it actually ends up being a lot more life but here's the idea when we start firing these you'll see that we can fire a decent amount of them per second it's pretty all right but as we start to spawn cremations you'll see that it just completely eats up anything that we put near it you see how many of these are popping it's a lot so not only are each of these corpses popping and doing you know six percent of their total life and damage on top of that we are a necromancer and necromancers have this particular node here called corpse pack what Corpse Act does is it gives you 2% increased attack and cast speed for each corpse consumed recently, up to a maximum of 200%. So what I'd like to show you is that if we look at, let's see, Unearth here. We go to Unearth, we look at our cast speed is currently at 8%, right? If I pop these down and I start popping some cremations, and you watch our cast speed, uh, we're at 130 so far, we're at 160, at 200, 209, 217 you can see we got pretty much maxed out cast speed. The amount of cast speed that we can get there is absolutely ridiculous. And the other cool thing about this is not only does that affect our cast speed, it affects our attack speed, which means that because we're using shield charge, if we're moving around a map and just, you know, popping down cremations, killing enemies and going as a, going about our business, we can also shield charge pretty fast. So that is the basic explanation of how this build works. Now beyond that, we do have quite a few defensive layers and we want to talk about how this build actually survives because it is pretty interesting. Now this build is an Aegis Aurora and Incandescent Heart CI build. So what that means is that we are energy shield, we are chaos inoculation. Chaos inoculation makes us so that we are immune to chaos damage or maximum life becomes one. So we are focused completely on getting energy shield. Now because we're completely immune to chaos damage, we can make use of Incandescent heart where 25 percent of our elemental damage from hits is taken as chaos damage which means that we are immune to that chaos damage we just take 25 percent of all elemental damage is just immune on top of that it does give us some armor some energy shield some gain elemental as extra chaos damage and the light radius is based on energy shield instead of life most of that doesn't really do a ton for us so we only get a little bit of energy shield there but the extra damage is pretty good and that 25 percent less damage is very very powerful on top of that we've got aegis aurora aegis aurora does two particular things for us one is it gives us five to maximum cold resistance which we'll talk about how we utilize that in a little bit but it also gives us the main 
gain ability of replenishes energy shield by 2% of armor when you block. Now, since we are using flasks that all have gain charges when you're hit by an enemy, we pretty much have our flasks up constantly when we are in simulacrums. And if you look at our defensives, just standing around doing nothing, we're at 32,600 armor. If we pop all of our flasks and then hit our molten shell, which is 10,000, we are at 64,000 armor with molten shell up. So all of those flasks are up pretty much constantly. They are all going to be used when charges reach full. So those flasks are always on when we're in simulacrums. If we're getting hit or anything else so we always have those flasks up we're always sitting at 50 to 60 thousand armor so if you take one or two percent of that and you replenish that much energy shield every single time that you block it ends up being an absolutely really ridiculous amount of recovery. So even if we're going with a conservative estimate of 50,000, that means that every single time that we are blocking, we are getting 1,000 energy shield back, 2% of 50,000. It's kind of a ridiculous amount of energy shield. It's a little bit more than that, but a thousand energy shield every single time we block. Now, because we do have our bone offering in a trigger wand, this is always going to be up. Our defensive layers increase because of 62 attack block, 66 spell block. You could get this a little bit higher if you needed to, but honestly, I don't really feel like we need to. But now let's talk about the second reason as to why Aegis Aurora is so powerful. We are using this for maximum cold resistance as well. You might notice that we have 89 all resistance, and this is mainly because of our gem that we've got, Melding of the Flesh. This makes it so that elemental resistances are capped by your highest maximum elemental resistance instead of whatever they normally would be. So because we have maximum cold res here, we've got maximum cold res on our gloves, and because we are using a purity of ice, which is level 24 from everything that's going on, we get an additional five additional max cold res, and all of these maximum resistances go together to be 89% maximum res. Now, if you wanted the full 90% maximum res, you are going to have to get two to maximum cold res on your gloves. This requires doing a whole bunch of stuff. You're going to have to up tier it to, I think it's like tier five or tier six to get maximum cold res to be 2%. It's not really necessary if I'm gonna be honest with you. But between all of those defensive layers, all of those recovery layers, and I haven't even really talked about, you know, the extra things like we have energy shield recharge that happens occasionally, we've got uh, energy shield regen, all kinds of good stuff like that. Between all of those things, we are essentially immortal. Now, I do want to give some time to talk about what I think are the bad things about this build, because it's not all sunshine and rainbows, it's not all good, there are some bad as well. The main thing about this build that is kind of annoying is the fact that the base pieces, just to get the build functioning, are ridiculously expensive. Like I said, it's like 13 exalt for phantasmal cremation right now, like 8 exalt for phantasmal on earth, and then you need at least like four-ish exalt to be able to make the gloves, and then you need to, be, need to be able to purchase all the other items, which is probably at least three to five exalt for everything else, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. But all of that together ends up being like 30 or 40, upwards of 50 exalt, just to get the basic pieces of the build working. Now, to be fair, those basic pieces are going to allow you to farm wave 30 simulacrums and most content of the game, but it doesn't actually provide you that much damage. This build does good damage, I'm not saying that it doesn't, but if you want to be able to do even more damage than this, you really do need to invest pretty heavily into getting some solid damage. Now, Griff has gone a little bit more in depth with this in his guide. He's tried to go like crit and such like that, but you're looking at spending anywhere from an additional 50 to 100 exalt to get crit and everything else working properly. And to be honest, I don't really personally want to spend that much money on this particular build. It does what I wanted it to do on 30 to 40 exalt. I don't want to spend any more than that. So we are going to be sitting here with this amount of gear and that is probably where I'm going to stop. I don't think I'm going to invest any more into this build. Now, all of the problems that I do have with it mainly stem from that I haven't invested significantly more money into it. The problem that I have is that it doesn't really do anything better than any of the other builds that I've played this league, except for being able to farm Simulacrum and very difficult maps. It's not better at bossing per se, it's tanky, so that means if you are someone who is not able to really survive a lot of boss encounters, it can survive pretty much everything. Besides like insta one shots, I'm talking about things that are meant to just kill you, as well as like the shaper balls that he throws, because those penetrate max resistances. 
I think you might even be able to survive those. Besides those like few things that are just meant to kill you, this build can survive them. So if you want to toss the money at it because you want to be able to survive those things, go ahead. But it's not like insane amounts of impressive damage. Like for example, the Ice Nova build that I played recently, for 25-ish to 30 exalt, you can get a build that does substantially more damage than this one and is not even close to as tanky, but is pretty sufficient. And there's so many other builds right now that can do so much more boss damage in particular that I wouldn't really consider this a bosser per se. This is much more a difficult encounter build. Now, beyond that, it is actually pretty decent in maps. Um, I will do just a random map for you. Um, I'll put this together right now. We're just going to grab a cemetery. We will quality it up. I don't know that I have any scarabs in there, but let's go ahead and look. We've got conversion, gloom shrines, magic monsters reflected. We will hit this with an alchemy orb. It looks halfway decent. I'll corrupt it, see what happens. Okay, so it went pretty difficult. Um, we're losing block. We're losing AoE. We are losing armor. Um, extra damage is lightning, temp chains, um, unique boss damage, attack speed, life, and area of effect. More magic monsters, monster variety. So we will go ahead and grab some scarabs. I'll just grab some stuff that's going to push monsters into the zone. Um, we'll do ambush scarabs and we will do harbinger scarab. Sure, that seems good. So we're going to do ambush, breach, harbinger, and ambush. This is just to get as many monsters in the zone as I can, just so you can see what I'm talking about with that. We will run domination on it just so we can get some more boys in there and we'll go ahead and run. Now, when we are mapping, this build actually isn't as bad as I expected it to be. I didn't think that clearing maps would be that good, but it did impress me, honestly. I think that the build is not the absolute best mapper that I've ever seen, but it does ramp pretty well when you start to get going. The main reason for that is because as you pop corpses and as you move around, you'll see how quickly my, uh, my shield charge is moving us around, and that is what I would say is like the main bonus here. Um, but yeah, so you get an idea. It does clear relatively well, even though this map is like ridiculously juicy. There's a lot in here, but it's nothing to like write home about. It's not the craziest map clear build. Um, the Ice Nova build that I was playing clears a little bit better. Um, even the Steel Champ that I've been playing does clear a little bit better. But that's not to say that it's bad clear, just it's better than I was expecting it to be. I expected it to be terrible, terrible, terrible clear, but it, it just, it isn't too bad. Nothing super special. So the build's really powerful. It can do some things, but once again, the main gripe that I really have with it is that it just doesn't excel at anything except very difficult encounters, unless you decide that you want to spend like a hundred exalt, if not more than that. If you want to spend all of that money, it's super duper powerful. I don't even know what that was. Was that a boss spawning in? Was that was that Chayula spawning in? I don't know what that big giant black hole was. I don't actually remember ever seeing that. Is Chayula here? Oh, whatever. Big giant black holes, who knows? I am not going to finish this map because there's more for us to talk about. Now, let's talk a little bit about these gloves. So these gloves are actually quite a bit easier to make than you might think. If you see these gloves, I know a lot of people have been coming in and like seeing the gloves whenever I use them on stream. They're like, what are those gloves? Those are insane. How did you get those? It's actually not as difficult as it might seem. Now, if you want to make these gloves that are not item level two, then they will be a decent amount more difficult to make, but really all that's going to get you is like 70 to 100 energy shield base, which is pretty good, but that's all that it's going to get you and it's going to make it cost like two, maybe three times as much as it could here. These are relatively straightforward. So to show you how to make these, we're gonna jump over into Craft of Exile and I'll show you exactly how to do it. So now that we're over here in Craft of Exile, the main thing that we are going to be looking for is we are going to be looking for the best way to get plus level of gems on a pair of gloves. Now you might be asking, well, big ducks, those don't actually exist. I, you can't do plus the level on gloves. Well, you can with a very particular fossil. Now it is important that these gloves are item level two. If you're wondering how you get item level two gloves, you are going to go make a new character. You're going to run and go kill Hillock, go into town. You can D-level with the D-level tome if you want to. You just either pick up some random gloves that dropped in the first zone or buy some from a vendor. You can go to the bench. You can four socket and four link them on the bench. Don't have to worry about that. Quality them to whatever you'd like. It doesn't really matter. And then you've got I level two gloves that will be the base for our crafting. So what you're going to be doing is if you go to fossils and we're looking for this faceted fossil here, 
Interestingly, when you put the faceted fossil on a piece of gear, it adds in these three modifiers. Now what we're going to be looking for is we're looking for dexterity as well as strength gems. So if we are doing both of these, the suffixes on the item and we compute the best selection, you will get a particular combo that is very, very, very solid for making these. You'll notice that the dense faceted pristine and scorched is going to be one try on average to get this outcome. So if you look here, we'll go into the emulator, we'll create a new item, we're going to create a pair of gloves. These are going to be church strength gloves, doesn't really matter. These super low level iron gauntlets, item level two, quantity 20, and that's all that we're looking for. So we are going to go ahead and do this same combo that you'll see here, dense, faceted, pristine, scorched. That's going to be dense, faceted, pristine, and scorched. Where is scorched? So these four together should pretty much guarantee at least every one out of two on average are going to have the ones that we're looking for. Now the idea here is that we're going to be looking for strength as well as dexterity. If you get those two things, you are good. However, a lot of the time you're going to get all three, as you can see that it's just kind of all three a lot of the time. If you do get all three, it's perfectly fine. However, the two that you're looking for are strength as well as dexterity. You're gonna get it quite often. Strength and dexterity again. That's strength and intelligence, not what we're looking for. Strength and dexterity. But we're gonna keep going till we get all three. It's just because this is the easiest to craft on. So we've got intelligence, we've got strength gems, and we've got dexterity. It's gonna cost probably an exalt to roll these roughly, depends on what the current prices are. Once you get to this point, you can do a couple things. What we're going to do is we're going to hit this with a craft, which is going to be suffixes cannot be changed. So we're gonna to go to the bench, prefixes, we're going to hit it with suffixes cannot be changed. And then we are going to hit it with a veiled chaos orb. Now you are looking for either plus two to level of projectile gems or plus two to level of AOE gems. This is the main thing that's going to determine the cost of these gloves. If you get it in one try, the gloves are like three exalt, very, very cheap. You can get unlucky and it might take two or three. For me, my streamer RNG got completely reversed and it took me like four, but it is what it is. You hit it with the Veiled Chaos Orb, you're gonna unveil, and of course we don't get it on the first try. We'll undo, say we crafted suffixes cannot be changed again, hit it with another Veiled Chaos Orb, undo. And of course, here we go, Streamer RNG is kicking in, third try is always the charm, and we didn't get it again. Making me look bad, game. All right, plus two to level of socketed AoE gems. So you get the plus two to level of socketed AoE gems, and then you are going to craft whichever one you did not get. So if you get AoE, you're gonna craft projectiles, and there you go, your gloves are finished. Now, if you have another open prefix, you can do pretty much whatever you'd like. There's not really a lot of mods that are worth slamming onto this because they're item level two gloves. You're really not gonna get anything crazy, so I suggest that you just don't do anything, don't waste your currency beyond this. Now, if at any point, for some reason, you do get your prefixes filled and your prefixes get messed up, you can do something like a harvest craft, uh, the other ones where it is reforge keeping suffixes, and then you can get your suffixes back and keep your prefixes open, restart from the previous step I said before. But once you get to this point, your gloves are pretty much done. Now, if you want to spend a lot more money and you want to try to make these gloves extremely good, I would suggest doing something like getting a pair of of sorcerer's gloves that have like plus energy shield or something like that fractured on them and using those gloves as a base it's going to be significantly easier significantly more expensive but i'm just going to suggest you stick with these so as a little bit of a recap we'll do these quickly again just to show you creating a new item we need to source some eye level two gloves just some super low level eye level two gloves we're going to use dense faceted pristine scorched we're trying to get plus one strength plus one dexterity a lot of the time you're going to get plus strength plus intelligence and plus dexterity we're going to benchcraft the suffixes cannot be changed hit that with the suffixes cannot be changed we're using a veil chaos orb because we are looking to get plus two to aoe or plus two to projectiles if you don't get it you're going to have to craft suffixes cannot be changed again hit it with another veil chaos orb and unveil until you get either plus two to socketed projectiles or plus two to aoe you are going to then craft on whichever one that you did not get and the gloves are finished. Now, do keep in mind, this is one of those builds where there's lots of little things that are very important. Uh, one thing that's gonna be pretty tough is getting the right amount of stats on your gear. You're really gonna need to get a lot of strength and a lot of dexterity on your gear. You'll notice I have 51 strength on my weapon, 43 strength on one of my rings, 36 strength on another one of my rings, as well as I think that is it, right? We got some all stats there. Oh, and I've got 48 dexterity on my belt as well. We have to get the vast majority of our strength and dexterity from our gear just to be able to use our gems and such. 
Obviously, intelligence is not really a big issue or in the intelligence part of the tree, but it is a pretty big deal to be able to get all of that. For a watcher's eye, you can kind of just do whatever you'd like. Um, I do feel that the minus mana cost while affected by clarity is very powerful. We do have minus mana cost on both of our rings as well because that is going to allow us to cast our unearth. One big problem that this build has has to do with mana. If you have noticed that when we get up to crazy amounts of cast speed, we are casting, uh, what's the cast time on our on our, on our unearth when we get up to max? Let's see. So we're at maximum cast speed modifier. Our cast time is 0.1. So we are casting at 10 times per second minimum, meaning that we are spending at least 70 mana per second with all of these mods on, which we can regen because we do have Essence Glutton, but you really do need that minus mana cost to be able to get things going. Beyond that, I've included pretty much everything that you're going to need to know in the path of building. It's not going to be a super in-depth path of building, it's going to give you a basic idea. Um, I would say that if you're going to level this build, you probably just want to level it with a similar tree, just kind of an Ignite, Armageddon brand, and then you can swap into this build immediately upon hitting maps. As soon as you can get Phantasmal Cremation, Phantasmal Unearth, and the gloves, which these gloves don't require any crazy levels or anything like that, you can swap over into the build and it functions. You can do it with health early on, and then when you get Incandescent Heart and as well as Aegis Aurora, you can swap right over right away. I was able to level up in tier 16 maps with like 2500 energy shield once I had all the pieces of gear together. It wasn't too bad, honestly. I still felt relatively tanky, so you should be able to manage it no problem. Just remember, all the rest of the information is in that path of building that's in the description. And that is going to be it for the video. Now, if I missed anything, make sure to go check in the path of building, check in the notes, go check Griff's guide, and as a last last resort, you can always join my Discord. It's all linked down in the description. There are a bunch of helpful people over there, but feel free to go and check all of those resources first, as the people in my Discord are not there just to help you. They're there to hang out with, which you should do. But if you've got the money and you want something that's a pretty comfortable simulacrum farmer, I do suggest that you give this build a try. I don't know that it will survive into next patch, so I probably would try it now. So if you're looking to play a pretty crazy build that takes almost zero damage, you can kind of just face tank wave 30 simulacrums, get in on it now, it's expensive, but it is what it is. So remember, boys, if you're enjoying the content, give this video a like, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit that notification bell to stay up to date with all the latest videos, and stay safe out there in right class. And I'll see you guys in the next video.